in the class okay all right okay so what did we discuss in the last class towards the end of the last class does anyone remember what were we discussing i think if we go if we look at uh, session outline yeah so we discussed these concepts please make sure you read up a little bit on L occam's razor uh, you should understand this principle it's a very important principle it comes into play in many uh, aspects of life okay we work there are some further developments the ceo has been kicked out you've noticed that softbank all these things and you learn when you watch all this stuff you see softbank was already they had already put in 10 billion dollars so when you borrow a lot of money from someone he, he is the one who is nervous not you because if you get into more trouble he has to pump more money into you to keep keep you alive so this is what happened with softbank they pumped uh, 10 billion into we work earlier now we work has get gone into trouble now they are pumping in another 10 billion so the ceo is out so there are all kinds of when you watch all these stories you should see all the corporate governance you heard about corporate governance because they have to buy out the majority share from the ceo there were some agreements yeah yeah so he owned the shares so he owned the shares the guy called newman right so he owned the shares and so they had to buy him out because they wanted to take control of the company but the main problem is they are already pumped in 10 billion so that was too big a loss to take so they are basically what they are doing is they are doubling down See, this is the same as when you buy something and it falls in value. Instead of cutting your losses, you're buying more because the loss is so big you can't afford to take it, right? So they they are doubling down. So watch all these things and think about all these aspects, corporate governance issues. And in this particular company, there were you guys have heard of governance, corporate governance? Yes. You're doing doing some courses on ethics and all that. So this, this so this is pretty big right now, corporate governance. And so this is actually a classic. So you should study the WeWork story a little bit. You'll find lots of uh, in, uh, discussions on on the Bloomberg Technology programs and other places. Study the WeWork case as a case. It's one of the worst cases of governance because all kinds of uh, shenanigans were going. on related party transactions you know what related party transactions are like if i'm the chairman of the board of a company and i'm giving some fat cat contracts to my brother to my cousin uh, you know so this is not allowed you can't have related party transactions so there's a conflict of interest so all these kinds of things all this kind of uh, shenanigans were going on in we work so we work is a very good case of how not to govern a company so do read up on that this is how you build up your experience right and you connected to okay so we discussed vega versus uh, uh, we discussed the meaning of eyeball in detail and we looked at uh, the uh, changes in vega, uh, how the vega is longer for uh, uh, vega is higher for longer dated options so all these things we did yesterday uh, the previous day okay so now we are looking at another topic which is understanding that this is just a, um, a not a strict relationship let's uh, yeah this i've already written this is not a law of physics okay when we use this expression what what we mean is that this is not always true this is true pretty much of every relationship that you look at in finance okay and economics is that you can't rely on this there's only one law in economics which always works which is that people respond to incentives okay human beings respond to incentives that's why socialism fails because human beings are selfish and they always try to maximize their own benefit and they always respond to incentive if you give them incentives they'll they'll respond to it so this is the only law of economics that always works and the rest of the laws are not necessarily guaranteed to work all the time okay so um now the other topic we are looking at now is directional moves in the underlying asset versus directional moves in the eyeballs okay we already know what the relationship there is okay where is our right so today we have changed the ticker a little bit just for fun any did they, did any big event happen from a governance perspective at oracle recently last 10 days or so Hmm? Yes, should she said something? Not the owner of Oracle, the CEO of Oracle, the co-CEO of Oracle, Mark Hurd, who is one of the leading, uh, one of the big, uh, well-known figures in in technology sales. 
Okay, he's a big marketing guy. He was earlier with HP and all that. So Mark Hurd died at a very young age. He's 62 or something. So he died. The owner of Oracle is well, not the owner now. Is uh, the ownership is dispersed? But who's the founder of Oracle? You are, you are graduating as business students. So these are all iconic names. It's like you don't know who is the founder of Microsoft. If you don't know, huh? If you don't know who is the founder of, uh, it's like you don't know who is the founder of Apple and who is the founder of Microsoft. You don't know these. Uh, I'm sure that also Bill, uh, other, who is the other guy along with Bill Gates who founded Microsoft? That also you don't know. Paul Allen. Paul so Paul Allen, Allen passed away. Okay, few days, few days back. Okay. So anyway, so uh, so these things. Go go to YouTube and watch a movie called. It's a very nice movie. We were shown this movie in in 1988 when I joined and Ahmedabad in our first year. We were shown this movie and it's still a nice movie. I think it's called In Search of Excellence. I'm sure if you look at, uh, I, you, I'm sure you can find the PDF also. It's by uh, uh, Tom. Uh, Waters and Peter, uh, Waterman, Tom Peters and Waterman or something like that. So a couple of guys from McKinsey wrote this book. It's a very well-known book in strategy. It's that old, okay? In 1988, it was already a one well-known book. But there's a film as well. We were showing this, shown this movie, uh, In Search of Excellence. So you can see all these and those lessons I think are still valid, okay? So these are all the, so founder of Oracle is Larry Ellison. Okay, so Larry Ellison is one of so those who are going into sales. You saw that guy who came from Oracle in your HR conclave. Okay, so he's or, he's a sales guy. Oracle is well known as a very hard charging sales organization. The very effective sales uh, team because now they are struggling because they did not go into the cloud fast enough. They stuck with their on-site legacy software, uh, you know, licensed software. Uh, whereas the um, most of the market moved into uh, cloud-based software. So you see companies like Salesforce, have you heard of Salesforce? Yes. So Salesforce.com, they have done, Salesforce actually is founded by a guy who is an offshoot, he used to work at Oracle. So the guy called Mark Benioff, who is actually one of the early guys who was working at one of the early buddies of uh, Ellison, who used to work at Oracle, then he moved into, he started his own company, Salesforce.com. Okay, so uh, Salesforce's ticker is CRM. You know what CRM is? Customer Relationship Management. That's this kind of software they make. That's why their ticker is CRM. Okay, so Salesforce, if you look at the Salesforce chart versus the Oracle chart, okay, you'll see there's a big difference. Salesforce has outperformed significantly because the market has moved significantly to the cloud and Oracle is actually late to the cloud. Okay, and um, in fact, uh, recently there was one uh, big event that happened. Amazon used to run their entire uh, e-commerce business, okay, uh, on the Oracle cloud. But now they have just shifted it onto their own cloud. So that's a big blow for Oracle. Okay, so all these uh, all these things. So when you watch all these things, if you keep track of all this news, there's a continuous series of lessons coming to you from strategy, marketing, technology, finance, everything. So this is how you have to look at the world of business because nothing comes in a silo. That okay, I'm now giving you only a finance problem. It doesn't work like that. Okay, so most of the time you get problems which are all mixed up. Uh, you know, with I mean different domains uh, all mixed up together. So you have to watch unless you keep on monitoring business. Uh, news continuously your understanding of the business of the business world will not develop in the way that it should right because your MBA to remember your MBA students people expect from you certain things good communication skills uh, familiar with office productivity software okay then uh, also uh, being able to look at most importantly being able to take a strategic view being able to look at a business from a strategic perspective looking at all the different domains the marketing aspect the technology aspect the finance aspect okay all these things looking the supply chain operations aspect looking at it being able to integrate all these aspects and look at a business like that that's what people expect from MBA students right so these are because remember you're not a hardcore uh, you know programmer okay so therefore the skill set is different so you have to make sure that you develop that skill set is this clear okay a lot of non-finance lectures but I think these things are important from time to time to properly oriented yes Okay, so we have Oracle now. We have the chart of Oracle. What was I saying? Why did I get into this long lecture? Okay. Yeah. So the next topic that we are actually going to discuss 
is this concept of uh, the directional what is the relationship between the directional moves in the underlying asset and the directional moves in the eyeball charts okay so here you have an easy way for any of your symbols you can just enter it at least two years of data you'll get okay uh, you can see the relationship you can see the uh, blue mountain chart being the uh, underlying asset this is the Oracle stock price and the red line being the eyeball okay so you can see this now what we say in the in the market is that generally we expect let's look at this chart so I've given you this hyperlink okay we can open this is all in your notes okay so let's look at this uh, yeah let's look at the point that they're trying to make you can read all this so what they're trying to say essentially is this is again as I said this is not a law of physics but generally we expect this uh, the market expects something like this that when the market drops the eyeballs when the underlying asset prices drop the eyeballs will go up and when the underlying asset price so what did I say yeah when it drops when the so the relationship is inverse when the underlying asset price drops the eyeballs are expected to go up and when the underlying asset price uh, rises the eyeballs are expected to fall okay so as I said this is a very general kind of relationship you can't rely on it okay the, that if I put this much uh, velocity on this particular body it will move at this speed you can't make this kind of mechanical calculation but this is what we normally expect okay and the theory behind that is this that if you see here we can look at certain cases where this is happening okay what happened here what is the talk why are people talking what happened now we have to cut marks for um, Rajan and Garvit. Why is your bag hiding your face? Put the bag down. <coughs> One minute. I haven't deducted marks for a long time. I, not that I want to, but you are leaving me with leaving me with no choice. Okay. What is today? Today is twenty-five. Okay, what happened? More talking. No talking. I don't want to hear any talking. Anybody looking here and there, looking at uh, you have to look at me, and you have to be intently following what is going on in the class. Okay, guys. So now this is what we are. This is the the, the relationship that we are talking about. As you can see here, as so for instance, I'm just giving you one example. So obviously, this is not a foolproof kind of example, but I'm just giving you some examples here. You can see as the market uh, falls here, as the underlying asset falls in value the eyeball rises very sharply can you see that yes sir. okay and if you also look at uh, the numbers that these guys have crunched this is from the SIBO website okay this as I told you is a very good website very reliable website you can study from here okay anything that is here is going to be reliable okay all right now you can see here look at this so when the S&P is up and the VIX is down okay uh, this is what they're finding out here okay so um, this inverse relationship that they're finding so this is what they're trying to document that when the stock index goes up the VIX tends to fall the VIX is basically the ball index for the S&P 500 okay you know that we have the India VIX as well so VIX is a trademark okay so VIX uh, is trademark I guess Standard & Poor's or somebody I don't know who owns the trademark but it's one of these companies like S&P so they have licensed this trademark to uh, the NSE okay and the NSE is now publishing the India VIX index you can chart the India VIX here as well if you go here if I hope everybody has a uh, has a uh, subscription by now okay you can actually chart the India VIX here also if you want to ex examine so the India VIX is meant to be related to the uh, uh, nifty 50 I think this India confuses the system Oh, I've lost. Oh, okay. How how did this happen? I forgot to even. Uh, I forgot to even connect to. And today there's no. Um, there seems to be no. Where's the test? See, I didn't even connect to the. Uh, okay, there we have test. That's why. Uh, all right. So anyway, so VIX. So is this clear? Yes, sir. VIX is 
an index of eyeballs okay so the True, original VIX was uh, meant to be uh, still there today that's uh, that's uh, giving you the eyeballs for the S&P 500 index and I've given you the True, SPY you ticker to trade SPY is just one tenth of the S&P 500 index okay you can see it here it's normally some of you will get the S&P as uh, the SPX as an index but this is basically one tenth okay so the, you'll see that the uh, S&P is 10 times the S&P 500 index is 10 times the size 10 times this uh, figure okay so the SPY for all practical purposes when you're wondering about the VIX chart the ball uh, the eyeball chart for the SPY ticker okay you basically just look at the VIX all right so which is what I've done here uh, I've given you in fact if you look at your um, I think maybe we have to do it again yeah so here you see you can get India VIX as well all right and you can get this is the SIBO ball index all right so this is the VIX as you can see the VIX gives you the eyeball chart for the S&P 500 index for the options on the S&P 500 index and so for all practical purposes your SPY ticker which tracks this index you can use the VIX charts you'll get lots of long-term data for that so and be aware that India VIX is uh, also available for comparing it to the uh, nifty 50 index okay so uh, this is a case of licensing once again you see your intellectual property laws you should be able to connect it okay that there is a legal aspect involved here when you're licensing an index all right so uh, the we're going back to our relationship here all right so this is an inverse relationship so I'll just briefly explain to you has everyone understood this that we intended, this is what we normally expect okay so now the logic for this is it's really sort of derived from the stock markets the logic for this no, is typically that uh, most stock market investors are net long okay the most stock market index uh, investors are net long okay and therefore when the market starts to drop they start losing money right and what they do is in response to their uh, you know them, them losing money what they do is they try to buy put options as insurance okay right something like along the lines of what Garvit was suggesting a couple of sessions ago if you remember but not exactly this but something similar he was trying to protect the risk on his position right so basically understand this stepwise what is the logic for this you should be able to understand this don't just me mechanically memorize that there's an inverse relationship what is the origin for this theory the origin for this theory is that the um, that stock investors normally are net long okay they trade from the long side they don't have a long short bias they typically trade only long only all right and so they're long only and so when the market starts to drop that's the underlying asset price starts to drop we we can uh, so with the underlying asset price starts to look and look at this part only just to although the relationship is not great we'll just look at this part just to make a case all right so when the market starts to drop what happens is the long only investors they start to lose money on their positions are you following right then they want to buy some insurance to protect their positions okay and then they go out and start buying put options okay and then buying as that push pushes what happens when there's an excess demand for put options what will happen to the price of put options fall rise okay and prices of options rising means what happens to the eyeball chart somebody said decrease up right not down up yes so we are convinced because eyeballs are an index of option prices so if option prices are going up means when you look at the eyeball chart the eyeball chart will go up okay and remember this we have you haven't done this relationship yet but there's a relationship between put and call prices through the relationship of put call parity so when put prices go up call prices will also be pulled up okay because of that arbitrage no arbitrage relationship okay between calls and put so this is basically what happens this is the logic behind this theory there's a theory that as you can see they have also empirically documented this is the pro this is what they've empirically documented okay for a particular period but again remember this that this um, this I'll just come back to this okay uh, that uh, so the theory by first understand the theory why is there an inverse rate because stock investors are net long when the market starts to drop they're losing money so what they try to do is they try to cover their losses by buying put options as insurance is everyone clear why if you are net long if your underlying asset position is long on stocks okay uh, long on equities 
then uh, when you start when the equity market starts to drop the kind of insurance that you are going to buy if you are buying options is going to be buying put options is everyone clear about that okay that you're not going to buy call options right so you buy put options and then that pushes up the price of put options which essentially means that the put option eyeball goes up okay and then the uh, the call option right prices also go up so the eyeball index goes up right okay is this clear all right so this is the logic now I just mentioned one more thing very briefly which is uh, we should mention I think it's a very important point which many people don't emphasize even you know uh, serious academic discussions also we don't emphasize this now let's let's use this chart okay to understand certain things about the empirical uh, empirical analysis and economics and finance and in social sciences generally okay as you know uh, you guys have followed this recent Nobel Prize award that has been given to this guy Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo and all so they have brought a lot of empirical analysis to economics okay and they have tried to analyze the social problems and socio-economic phenomena through empirical analysis okay but understand one thing about empirical analysis the problem with empirical analysis is that especially in fees can everyone read the numbers may can you read the numbers now 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 Huh? No, don't worry about the colors on the graph. I'm talking about this. Okay, let's just understand this. Okay, just note this. I'm not even going to look at the chart. Can you see the periods on top here? 7, 2, 12? No, that's what I'm saying with the average color on that. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Okay, let me just make this point from one, with just by, just a very important point. Okay, that understand this, this is, we can just take this. What have these guys done? They have taken this period. I'll read out the numbers for, for you. Okay, this is 7 to 12, which means 2nd July 2012. Okay, 2nd July 2012 to 25th September 2012. It's a very short period. Okay, they have used, uh, and you can also look at this. You can also look at this and you can see how to what extent the uh, like this particular sharp rise and eyeball fall comes around this sharp fall in the stock price. Okay, here again there's a sharp fall in the stock price, there's a rise in eyeball. Okay, now what these guys have done is let's just look at this relationship from July 2012 to September 2012, they have done this analysis. Okay, and in this period they have found that this 80% of the time when the SP is up, the VIX is down. <laughs> Okay, 82%. And then uh, when the S&P is down, the VIX is up, 78%. Okay, can you read these numbers at least? Yes. You can read, Sylvie, so last bench, yeah. Okay, so this is what they have found for this period, okay, from July to September. Now, the point I want to emphasize, actually, it should be quite obvious, but I think sometimes because you are new to the whole uh, subject and the whole method of analysis. Okay, so um, the, the point to understand here is, okay that this finding this 82 percent okay this 82 percent and 78 percent is necessarily true only for this period okay if you you have already seen a flavor of this when you guys did your beta calculations remember you've done lots of beta calculations yes nodding is not aggressive enough okay now uh, anjum and galati also are, are involved in some major calculations I think they're calculating eyeballs. They're calculating eyeballs. Okay. So we can add them numbers also. Special mention. Okay. All right. Okay, so here a very important lesson. Please make sure you understand this. You have already you are already familiar with this. You did beta calculations, and you must have done more than one beta calculation for one company, right? Do you remember that if you change the look back period? Okay, so if I'm doing Oracle beta, if I'm calculating the beta of Oracle, if I calculate it for the for from today looking back one year, if I take that as my historical data, that is I get some number. Let's say I get one. Okay. But if I take now, if I take uh, from today to looking back three years, will I necessarily get one? I'll probably get some other number, right? 
so this therein lies a lesson a very important lesson for you that whatever so i think it's very important to emphasize this because i'm very concerned about students getting uh, you know losing sight of all these aspects okay that don't take these are nothing there's nothing golden about these numbers 82.5 82 and let's say 82 and 78 these numbers apply only to this period 2nd july to 9th uh, 25th september of 2012 okay if you take any other period these numbers may not remain the same so you can't basically i mean what i'm trying to say is that if you you decide a trading system based on this data of course normally you use much more data but if you use a trading system and you assume that 82 percent of the time in the future also this will happen this relationship will hold that is not true are you able to follow i mean maybe it's very simple thing very obvious is it obvious or what nobody is responding half the class most people i don't know some people are looking down some are looking I need to get a response. Yes, no. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes. So get that. What is the problem? It's the first, second class. You need some coffee. <laughs> Everybody is half, half dead. Respo I need to get good responses so that, you know, I can... Tata coffee is good. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Yeah, well, we don't have. See, coffee futures. Can you see the volatility? This is cents per pound. Nymex coffee. Can you see the... Uh, this is dollars per pound, actually. Can you see the volatility in coffee prices? Commodity prices are very volatile, okay? So can you see what is happening in coffee prices? Look at the movement from 2012, 2011, from a high of $3 is gone below $1. Okay, just think about what is happening to coffee farmers. Okay, so this is good for Nescafe or bad for Nescafe? Good, 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 Nescafe. good for Nescafe, very good. But very bad for coffee farmers. We have coffee, we grow coffee here also in India, South India we grow coffee. Vietnam is one of the big coffee, yeah? Okay. Yeah. So we will have. We won't have coffee. We'll have copper, uh, crude oil, and gold. Okay. All right. But I just wanted to show you this, and hopefully this will wake up people. Some people who are falling asleep. Okay. Coffee futures. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, let's go back to this. So just an important lesson here. Just make sure that everybody understands. Okay. Please look up, Garvit, what is happening? Look up, we'll have to have these, uh, some kind of a clip mechanism for somebody, you know, the head should be always pulled up like this, like a lamp or something like that, okay? So, um, okay, so when you get this kind of an empirical calculation of a relationship, this is necessarily true only for that period. If you take a different period, this relationship need not hold. So don't become enamored of this that, oh my God, there's an 82% relationship, 82% uh, of the time this relationship works. So I can design a trading system based on this. So I just want you to be careful that these kinds of, in, in, in this is true in, uh, this is not true in the hard sciences. In the hard sciences, you can rely on it because the, the items that you're measuring are stable. Okay. But in marketing, because you're dealing with consumer behavior, okay, you're in economics, in finance all your all these cases you are essentially dealing with the same kind of problem erratic human expectations human human behavior okay which is not stable okay not reliable so therefore be aware of this problem is everyone clear about what i'm trying to say here okay just just a lesson i mean i'm not going to ask you in the exam that this what is this but it's these are things most some of the most important learnings are actually not things which i can ask you in the exam Okay, that's why I say that exams are not really a big thing. But if I'm giving you, if we are giving you degrees, then you need to have exams. If you're happy to give up the degree, then I, I, I won't give you exams. Okay, so it's a great system actually. No attendance, no exams, no grades, but placement. No, no, but one minute, one minute. One minute. One minute. No company will hire you because you have no more crutches. It's much worse for you. Now you have no crutches. You can't point to your grades. You can't point to this uh, whatever I got A+. plus. The company will only evaluate you based on your knowledge. 
yes intense interviews right companies will gauge you based on their knowledge on your knowledge and your knowledge comes out in your body language your confidence comes out in your body language and confidence comes from hard work whatsapp will not give you confidence okay so okay remember all this now uh, i don't know why i keep getting lost and how did i even get here i don't know this actually happens this actually happened there was a guy who worked at ashok gaming and ashok university was founded in this way Okay, in which way? <laughs> okay, we'll do it later. We'll do it later. Okay, no, no, I don't want to discourage him from making a point. Give him a mic. Let him make a point. The whole point, the whole point of cl- uh, coming to class is being able to make your points and ask your questions. One minute, guys. Please be quiet. Be quiet. Now make your make your point. Yeah. Mike, Mike, Mike. Again, you're putting the mic. Mike, through the mic. Why?
okay they are collecting premium from you because when you buy car insurance you have to pay out premiums first to the car insurance company and then if something happens to your car then you can go and make a claim okay so you're making a claim is just like the equivalent of exercising the option you understand that yes everybody yes sir so when you make a claim is the equivalent of somebody exercising the option but the option seller has already collected the premium up front usually they collect the premium up front sometimes you can rearrange it using those annuity formulas so the same thing that you are instead of collecting it up front you take the same thing so you convert it into an annuity so that both of them have the same present value okay so you can structure it that way if you want but usually the premium is paid up front okay so the option seller the car insurance company it collects the premium up front and then hopes that nothing happens to your car so you don't file a claim okay so is this clear okay so if you ever forget about option premiums and who is taking money who is losing who is paying out money who is receiving money just go back to your car insurance company example okay the insurance companies are option sellers all right okay now let's look at payoff and profit profiles okay this is there in your figure 10.1 so let's look at figure 10.1 Please make sure you're doing your uh, no uh, readings. The readings that I've given to you in the notes, okay? Okay, ten point. Yeah. What have I said here? Ten point one to ten point five. So let's go to ten point one. So have you understood this? Be careful. Don't use words in the wrong way. When you mean payoff, don't say profit. They're not the same thing. Okay. So the profit is payoff adjusted by premium. Okay. So whatever your prof profit will always be less than the premium. Okay. Sorry, less than the payoff. Okay. If you're an option buyer, you'll be less than because you've already whatever payoff you get. From that, you have to subtract the cost of the premium to find out your net profit. Okay, so if you get a payoff of ten dollars on an option, but you paid two dollars for premium for it, so your profit is only eight dollars, but the payoff is ten dollars. Okay, all right. So let's look at. Uh, okay, now make sure you understand this. Have you guys seen these diagrams before? Yes. When you did FM one, FM two, you did options. Did you see these diagrams? Yes. You have done them. Yes. Though some are saying yes, that means you have done it. Those who are saying no means they've forgotten. You've forgotten, right? So these are called these are called. Have you heard this term? These are called hockey stick diagrams. Okay. So what kind of hockey are they referring to? Ice hockey, not field hockey, right? So these are called hockey stick diagrams, right? So uh, you should be aware of this. So if somebody asks you. Are you aware of these hockey stick diagrams for uh, for options? Then don't say, "Oh, what is hockey stick?" Okay. So uh, be aware that these are called hockey stick diagrams. Okay. So please make sure you understand this. Look at this picture, and look at the profit from buying an option, call, uh, a European call option. Okay. The strike price is hundred. Okay. And they are plotting the profit. Okay. Uh, look at the profit here. Just make sure that you understand this. So the strike price is hundred. You have bought from buying a European call. Okay. Please tell me if I'm going too slowly. If all of you guys have understood this already, then we don't need to cover this. Do I need to cover it? Yes. Sir. Yes. Okay. All right. So just understand why this chart is like this. Okay. So on the on this uh, here you have the profit and then you have the stock price. This is the we are talking about European options. So these are actually expiration diagrams. Another thing you have to understand about hockey stick diagrams is these are expiration diagrams usually. Okay, the hockey stick shape comes in during expiration. Okay, so we are talking about different scenarios. How do we construct this chart? This line, this line is basically just constructed by joining dots. And how do we put up each of these dots? How do we plot each of the dots? Okay, let's take one dot. Let's take ninety. So these are expiration diagrams. So understand that these are expiration diagrams, which means we are talking about scenarios where I bought a hundred, a hundred strike call. Okay, I paid five dollars, and then at expiration, 
the stock price is 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, etc., etc. So I consider all these scenarios and I see what is my profit and then I plot the profit against that. Okay. Okay. It's just, just like any other XY graph. All right. So when the stock price is 90, I bought a 100 strike call. Will I exercise the call? Ritesh? I bought a 100 strike call and the stock price at expiration is 90. So will I exercise the call? One minute, one minute. Let them answer. No, why not? What is higher? What is eight? Strike price is higher than what? One minute, guys. Please be quiet when I'm asking questions. Yes? Then the expiration price. Well, actually, what you should be saying is market price at expiration. If the stock price, the strike price is higher than the market price of the underlying asset at expiration. So it is cheaper for me to buy the underlying asset at 90 in the market rather than exercising the option and buying it at 100 that's how you should be answering this kind of a question because remember you have to always answer questions for your own mental training you have to answer it as if you are talking to a computer okay you can't just give one way answer human beings may understand but computers won't understand if you train yourself to talk to a computer all the time when you're discussing business related matters it will sharpen your thinking okay all right so when the stock price so 90 is clear to everybody so i don't exercise the option so what is my profit then what is my pnl let me not say profit what is pnl you understand what is my pnl premium, huh? premium. who said premium now i'm asking you what is my pnl like if I buy dollar Swiss at 99.70, uh, 1 million dollar Swiss and I cut my loss at 99, what is my PNL? It will be some loss number. Okay. So in this same way, I'm asking you, if I bought this 100 strike call and the market price at expiration is at 90 and then I paid $5 premium for it. So what is my, um, uh, what is my PNL at expiration? Hmm? Sorry? 15 loss. Okay. Anybody else? Any other loss number? Like bingo, we can go around and have loss numbers. Numbers, anybody, any eyes? Shreya, what is the number? 15 loss? No. Five loss. Okay, is this clear? Okay. So, one minute. Now, Gulati and Anjum, we have to deduct marks again. They are becoming very active as a group. Again, you are discussing. No, 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 no. You, I don't know what, what you are doing. Then you come somewhere else. You come and sit next to me. Come across since you are on the outside. Come, don't. Uh, first, let me increase their premium. One minute. <laughs> One minute. To the part two. One minute. I can't even see the carrot sign. To the part two. Okay. Gulati, come and sit. Come and sit next to Mehak. What is the time? No, no. One minute. You come. Don't, don't, don't lose more marks for yourself. Come and sit here. So here there are already two people sitting. No, no, he is tall, so I have to make him sit somewhere in the back because I can't sit him, uh, seat him in front and people won't. Come and sit next to me, but don't disturb her, don't distract her. No, no, you sit there, don't now, you don't create further problems. Come and sit next to me, that way you don't lose more points. Okay, this all, all these are, no, 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 not there, in, next to her. What, what problem does she have? Okay, fine, fine. So you just uh, make sure that you can uh, hear, see everything. Because here uh, you might have a sight problem. One minute, one. Okay. All right, so we are discussing payoff. Right, so is everyone clear in the case where the option price at expiration is 90? What is the loss, Shreya? Sir, according to which it will be 15, the market price is uh, like it's at 90 and the strike price is 100 and you keep paying 5 like five dollar premium. So that would be 10 plus 5 Okay, 5 dollars. So why the 10? So because market price is 90. Because Garvit is saying the loss should be 5. Others are also saying, some of them are saying now 5. So why the 10? No sir, I am saying it's 15. Yeah, so your 15 is made up of a 5 and a 10. Yes. So why the 10? So the 
And excise price is 100. But what is the first question I asked Ritesh? That when the market price is at 90 and you bought a European call with a strike of 100, at expiration the market price is 90, will you exercise the call? And what did Ritesh say? No. So if you don't exercise the call, that means you're not, what your 10 is coming from a visualization that you buy, you exercise the call, buy the underlying asset at 100 and then sell it in the market at 90 and incur a $10 loss. But that you're not going to do, right? Because you're rational, right? So that's, so that's why the loss is 5. Is everyone clear? Yes. Okay. So Please. The loss is equal to premium. Loss is equal to premium, that right? The first. Okay, I don't remember the, the, the context in which you said premium. Okay, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe, I'm not disputing that. I, I, it didn't seem to, uh, you know, make sense to me at that time, okay? Uh, okay, now, one more thing you guys have to notice, this is a expiration diagram, okay? So, now, strictly speaking, we don't, here we ignore, what are we ignoring if we show, if we are showing, let's say they have not given you the, uh, the tenor of the option here. They have not given you the tenor of the option. Let's say this is a five-year option. Okay, and let's say you bought thousands of contracts. Okay, and we are talking about the profit or loss per contract. Or let's say, so if you bought, let's say, in this case, what is the thing that they are not showing you? If they are showing at 90, they are showing it as minus 5. So, and these are expiration diagrams. So remember the premium is prayed up front. Okay, so the other thing to remember about hockey stick diagrams, so a few things. Hockey stick diagrams show, uh, typically when we say hockey stick, we are referring to the profit profiles, not the payoff profiles, but even the payoff profiles will look, look like hockey stick. So you can take hockey sticks diagrams as referring to both payoff and profit. Okay, profit is payoff adjusted by premium. Now, these are expiration diagrams. First of all, be clear that these are expiration diagrams so they are scenario and basically you plot it by doing a scenario analysis at expiration for different stock prices for different underlying asset prices don't say stock prices because uh, we need to use general terms okay so the other thing that they do is since these are expiration diagrams they ignore the time value of money so strictly speaking your loss is the five dollars premium but the five dollar premium had to be funded so in finance I think I've told you guys that when you are buying something, you bo you borrow and buy you buy it and put it on investment, okay? But when you are buying something, the other aspect is that you are always going to assume that you have borrowed the money to buy that asset, okay? So therefore, you have to look at the funding cost of the premium also. When you are actually doing, actually working in trading rooms and pricing different in instruments, okay, like futures or, or forwards or options, you have to be very clear about the funding cost. So whenever you are putting up premium at the beginning, remember premium is paid up front. Okay, premium is paid up front and these are expiration diagrams. So in these diagrams, we ignore the time value of money. But strictly speaking, your loss is actually 5 multiplied by the, uh, you know, 1 plus i factor for that period. Okay, whatever the period of the option is. So you have to look at the funding cost of the premium also. So strictly speaking, your loss is the premium initial outlay plus the funding cost of the premium. The interest cost on the money borrowed to pay the money for the premium to pay for the premium. Is this clear? Okay, another thing should be clear to you that this is the expiration and these we normally include the time value of money. Okay, so call option. Now, one more scenario quickly, let's do. So when the price is 120 at expiration, what do we do? First question we have to ask is, yes, Golati, when we are, when the price is 120 at expiration and we have bought a $100 under strike call, what do we do? Do we exercise the call or not? Yes, sir. We exercise it. And what is the profit on the exercise? 20. Okay. And what is our net profit? Well, actually, the payoff is 20. In this case, we'll say the payoff is 20. And profit is 15. Okay. We have paid 5. Okay. Ignoring the time value of money. So you will go from here and you will plot a 15 here. As you can see, this is kindly round 15. Can you see that? Okay. All right. So this is how this chart is created. Okay. So if you ever get lost, you create it like this from first principles. This is what you should know. You should not memorize stuff and just remember that, okay, this one looks like this and this one looks like this. You should be able to construct everything from, from the basic steps, uh, through the basic steps from first principles. Okay. Call option, payoff profile, it looks like this. And over time, as you play with this, okay, you have to remember, you have to keep on tinkering with this and playing with it until you become fluent in it. 
okay that is your comfort level whatever time amount of time it takes you to become fluent in it your job is to become fluent in it okay so uh, as you keep on doing it then eventually it will just become second nature because the moment you see it you will recognize it okay uh, all right so call options all this stuff you have to read okay make sure you read everything and understand okay what is this put option okay profit from buying a european put option okay let's see so strike price is 70 okay let's say at expiration the price is 50 dollars okay so if the ex if at expiration the price is 50 dollars okay and you have bought a uh, 70 put so what is happening are we uh, making money or yes anjum if i bought a 70 put and at expiration the price is 50 uh, what did i say 50 dollars <laughs> i bought a 70 put okay so this is how we speak in options we say that we just say the strike is 70 then we say i bought a 70 put that means the strike is 70. so i bought a 70 put and um, uh, when at the expiration the strike uh, the underlying asset price is 50 dollars so am i going to exercise my put or no no one minute one minute one minute only anju only Anjum should answer. One sec. Yes. I'm going to exercise the put. Why? Explain logically, stepwise, just like I answered Ritesh. I, uh, the, I was uh, coaching Ritesh how to answer. Explain to me logically, stepwise. I'm a computer. I don't know anything. Explain to me why I should exercise a 70 put uh, when, uh, uh, when the underlying asset price at expiration is $50. Is my question clear? Yes, your answer is correct but you have to explain to me why it's correct as if I'm a computer yes okay Tanya let's give her the mic give her the mic yeah tell me stepwise why should I exercise the 70 foot yeah uh, so because uh, the share price is uh it's 50 and uh, we have a put option of selling the shares at 70 so we will be making a profit of 20 but here the premium is also given up front so we will adjust that premium okay so actually one more thing which you should have said which a computer will not know that is the put option gives you the right to sell the underlying asset at the designated strike price okay so by holding a 70 put i hold the right to sell the underlying asset at 70. so when the underlying asset is at 50 at expiration by selling it at 70 by exercising the put and then further buying it back in the market at 50 because remember that's how you close the profit loop right you should not have any positions left okay you should be square so I can make a clean profit of twenty dollars. Okay, that is how you should answer it. Okay, therefore I should accept. Therefore I should uh, exercise the option. Okay, is this clear? What happened, Gulati? What is the problem? Sir, he is asking question to me. He is asking question to me. Sir, there will be a profit of twenty or thirty. Twenty. Thirty. No, sorry, the payoff is twenty. Correct. You're correct. So correct to point out the payoff is uh, is twenty. Okay, and the profit will be thirteen because there is a seven dollar premium amount that you pay okay now let's look at another example okay seven which is not we, we obviously is there okay let's say uh, the price is um, 68 okay 68 if the price is 68 I'm holding a 70 put yes now uh, Srishti what should I do? Should I exercise? No. Yes, no, or you don't know? No, sir. No. Why not? I'm holding a 70 put. The put option gives me a right to sell. Always practice answering questions like this. This is again not just for this answer, but it will try and train you to answer every question like this. Always train yourself to answer questions as if you're talking to a computer that will make all the stepwise logic very clear in your head because the computer doesn't know anything the put option gives me the right to sell the underlying asset at 70 at the strike price of 70 now i hold the 70 put the underlying asset price at expiration is 68 now should i exercise my option or not one minute srishti will answer first one minute then we'll come to we'll go to bharat or where's the mic over we'll go to arjun because the mic is nearer to her but let's Srishti answer is my question clear 
I'm holding the 70 put underlying asset at expiration is 68. Should I exercise or not? And I paid $7 premium upfront for the option. Should I exercise or not? What? No or yes? No. I should not exercise. Okay, good. So uh, now next, um, Anjum, what is your answer? No. You also know. Okay. And then uh, Sakshi. Oh, let's okay. Let's go to Sakshi again. We go by the mic theory. The, the proximity to the mic. Yes. One minute. Be, be quiet when one person is answering. So we will exercise the option. Okay. Why? So, so because. Uh, so Parul is also nodding aggressively. No, she doesn't want it. Kanwa also doesn't want it. You're all alone. Gulati, do you want to exercise or no? No. I know, I mean, we are not talking about MMA exercise. We are not exercise, option exercise. Yes. You also don't want to exercise. Okay. So if the share price is 68. Bharat is one minute. So Bharat, you also, you want to exercise? You want to exercise? You also don't want to exercise. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now let's see what only one person wants to exercise the option. Okay. Yes. Let's listen to her answer. If the share price is 68 and the strike price is 70, then two rupees we are saving here. Two dollars. Two dollars. Yeah. So two dollars and minus. Don't say I'm saving. Say that my payoff, payoff is two dollars. And seven dollars premium. So it will be minus five. And if I won't exercise the option, it will be minus seven. Correct. So Very good. I'm so this is how the question should be answered, right? So you should because remember the concept of sunk cost. You have done the sunk cost concept, okay, in your projects and all that. Yes. Now we'll come first. Let's give the answer clearly first. So, but the, she has given a very good way of answering. She has answered it very correctly. She looked at compared the two scenarios: either exercise or don't exercise. And if you don't exercise, you lose more money than if you exercise. One minute. Is this clear first? Okay. Now we come to the problems with the, uh, the disagreement. Okay. Give them. Give them the mic. Give them the mic. One minute. No, we are no. One minute. This question. This question is not acceptable because I have already made it clear. These are expiration diagrams. Okay. So I normally never say question is not acceptable, but if we are talking about dogs. Then again, you're asking, is this a dog? So this doesn't make sense. Okay. So these are expiration diagrams. Okay. Yes. And then she's right. Then she's not. So, but this was always obvious. These are expiration diagrams. What was I saying? I, when I repeated the question multiple times, I said the option uh, strike. I'm holding the 70 put. The underlying asset price at expiration is $68. I said at expiration. These are expiration diagrams. This is clear. I don't want to discourage people from asking questions, but the questions have to already factor in the information that has been given. Okay. All right. Yes. Everyone is clear. So therefore, you compare the two scenarios, whether you are and, and see where you make more profit. Okay. And you choose that course of action. Is everyone clear? Kushbu, you're clear. Okay. So now so that even at 68 we are exercising now what is the profit payoff at 68 is two dollars and the profit is five dollars uh, prof sorry Pro loss is pnl is minus five okay so you will see that um, if you look at 68 if you drop vertical from here it will be around minus five can you see that if you draw, uh, if you drop there and 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 then draw parallel, it will be around minus five. Yes, what happened? Hardik is very amused. <laughs> no, I'm just making sure that everybody understands how. I just like to point out through all the basic steps so that nobody is, you know, because anyway, you guys are not very focused on understanding everything step by step. No, you're skipping through the steps. That's not good. So I want to make sure everybody understands all the steps. Okay, that's why I'm doing it through baby steps. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, what is this? Remember, writing means. What does writing options means? We also use the word option writer. Option writer refers to buyer or seller. 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 Okay. So we also talk about option writers. Okay. It's just like you write an insurance policy. So the remember that insurance in insurance contracts. The insurance is written by the insurance. The contract is written by the uh, insurance company. Okay, so that's why if you remember, we had discussed a principle. Let's test your memory for lab from your legal aspects course. Uh, you express. You remember the expression called contra pro ferentum. Contra pro ferentum was discussed in which particular case? 
Guilford Motors versus Horn, I think. Oh no, it was discussed in um, Carlisle versus Carbolic Smoke Ball or um, yeah, it is. It, I think it was discussed in uh, Carlisle versus Carbolic Smoke Ball. No, no, I discussed it. Very, I'm very clear. I discussed it. What does contra proferentum mean? One minute. We also had this concept. Contra, contra proferentum will be important even for people who are going into HR roles. Because those of you who are going into HR roles, when you design employment contracts like yours, okay, employment contracts, if you remember, Gulati was asking about the fire insure of case of a fire in a factory which is not covered, okay. So I gave that example also where if contra proferentum means interpretation against the draftsman. So who has drafted the co contract? The insurance company, okay. So if there is any dispute, if there is any ambiguity, the first condition is there must be ambiguity. If it's very clear, then there's no room for contra proferentum. But if there is a dispute about a contract and there is an ambiguity in the clause, in the interpretation of the clause is not clear, okay, the words are not clear, then it will be interpreted against the party who has written the contract, who has drafted the contract. So in an insurance contract, if there is any ambiguity, like we said, I gave the example of that fire insurance case of Golari where you have to dump fire in the factory. If it's not clear that the factory is covered or not, then it will be interpreted in, against the insurance company, so the factory will be deemed to be covered. Okay, so remember all these things. So always jump around between disciplines. Okay, don't just get caught in finance. So you'll see legal aspects coming into play everywhere. So the insurance company writes the contract. So there's a dispute, ambiguous clauses. They will be interpreted by the court against the insurance company. Okay, the same principle came up in Carlisle versus Carbolic Smoke Ball because the Carbolic Smoke Ball company wrote the contract. Okay, so the ambiguities would have been interpreted against them, but that principle was not applied, but it was discussed. Okay, they didn't even mention contra proferentum, but I mentioned it because that is what the principle is called. You should remember it when you are doing employment contracts. Mayak. Employment contracts. Drafting our employment contracts, there should not be any ambiguous clauses. Right? Okay. So, what is this now? Option writer. This is a payoff profile for what? Selling of? Selling of what option? Short call. So you should be able, you should be, you should revise these things. You should be so familiar with these things that you can just recognize it like that immediately. Okay. So short call. Let's look at this. If this chart makes sense, if it is properly drawn. So I sold a call at hundred dollars. Okay. And the expiration at uh, the contract at expiration is, and the underlying asset price at expiration is. I'm just going to call it stock price because stock is a shorter word. But remember, when general principles, when you discuss, you should talk about underlying asset. Don't just say stock. Okay. Sometimes I've seen in, in the IPM exam paper, people, we are discussing a currency example, dollar Swiss. And people are answering saying stock is at, uh, stock has, uh, stock is stock prices, so and so. <laughs> Where did the stock price come from? Okay. So anyway, so you could have either written underlying asset price or you should have written the currency exchange rate or the currency is worth so much. Okay. So be careful. Don't just use, because everywhere we are trained to talk about stock markets. No, people come to me always and say, I want to learn about stock market. So, <laughs> but we have to talk about general principles. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, so so I sold at 100 call and the at expiration the uh, underlying asset price stock price is 130. So is the buyer of the option going to exercise? <coughs> no, the buyer of the option. I am what? I am the seller. I am the option writer so I am the seller now. Okay. So I am going to exercise. Yes Puneet, is my question clear? I am the seller of the option. at. Uh, expiration uh, price uh, is 130. I sold a hundred call. Is the buyer going to exercise at expiration? Yes. 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 Okay. Why? Again, give me a stepwise logical answer. <coughs> Use the mic. Give him the mic. Where's the mic? Give me a step stepwise logical answer. Why will the buyer answer? Uh, why will the buyer exercise the option? Yes. What happened? Exercise price is more. Exercise price is more. What is the exercise price? One thirty. Exercise price is not one thirty. 
strike price is the same as exercise price. Exercise price is 100. Uh, so you have to be careful about what you're saying. No? Uh, the other thing that you have to notice all the time for everybody is when you speak, a part of your brain has to be monitoring what you're saying. Okay, so because we are not perfect creatures, so everybody will make mistakes when you say something. But you should be able to monitor what you're saying and then make a correction that, okay, sorry, I, I said exercise price, but what I meant was market price. This is okay. But to be just saying market price, uh, the exercise price is higher and then don't even know, you're not even aware that you made a mistake, that's not acceptable. Mistake will be made, mistakes will be made, but you should immediately correct it by saying, because the part of your brain is monitoring what you're saying. Yeah, okay. So the strike price, uh, the the market price is higher than the strike price so why does it lead to the conclusion that the buyer of the option will uh, the buyer of the call will exercise the option I want a stepwise logical answer no pass bone Vida quiz contest pass it to uh, pass it to Gulati uh, 15 seconds or something you get right yeah yeah. So since the market price is 100 and the expiration price is 130, the buyer will go for. Again, you have flipped it around. Market price is 130. Exercise price is you. I don't know if you said expiration price, but the ex. No, the market price and expiration price. There's no. Then they're both referring to the same thing. The strike. You have to use the words strike price and market price at expiration. Option strike and option market price at expiration. So the option strike price is 100 and the market price at expiration is 130. Yeah. So for the buyer, it is showing that he will be getting a payoff of, of $30 and net profit of $25. Okay. So he will exercise uh, this option. Okay. So uh, the, I mean, the other part again which you failed to mention is that the call option gives the buyer the right to buy the underlying asset at the strike price. Because remember you are talking to a computer, you are not talking to me or somebody else who knows all these calls and puts you have to put yourself into the uh, into the that particular frame of mind okay so is this clear now call option gives you the right to buy the underlying asset at the strike price in here the scenario is such that if you exercise the call you will buy the underlying asset at 100 and immediately sell it in the market at 30 that gives you a 30 dollar payoff okay and so whenever you have a positive payoff you will ex the rule is basically that when there's a positive payoff you will exercise it because it allows you to reduce even in the worst case if the payoff is not greater than the premium that you paid it allows you to reduce the loss on the premium this is clear so whenever there's a positive payoff you will buy the option you will exercise the option okay this is clear Srishti are you following this is clear okay now short put okay this is a short put profile so if I bought a 70 if I wrote a 70 put if I wrote a 70 put and the expiration price uh, market price at expiration is say 90 uh, then will the buyer exercise the option Hardik. I wrote a 70 put and at expiration the market price is 90 will the buyer exercise the option yes, yes. 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 what will the buyer do the buyer is holding a 70 put what does that give him the right to do no let him answer what is the given the mic also that gives him the right to sell, uh, sell the underlying assets at? at at market price market price at, at strike price at the strike price what is the strike price the 70 70 and what is the market price 90, 90. okay so uh, if he exercises the option and sells the uh, underlying asset at 70, then is he showing a mark to market? What is the payoff? Is it positive, negative? What is it? One minute. Let let Hardik answer. One minute. Is my question clear? Hold the mic. Hold the mic. Like imagine you are a baby sucking your thumb. You know, put the mic close because most of your voices are not coming through the mic. Yes. Uh, hold the mic uh, yeah, properly so that the mic is coming through the the voice is coming through the mic. Yes. So, uh, so the last question was not clear. <laughs>
You have one minute. You have sold. You have sold a seventy. Uh, what is this? Seventy put. You have sold a seventy put. The market price at expiration is ninety. Okay. So you are saying that the buyer of the put is going to exercise the put. The put gives him the right to sell the underlying asset at the exercise price, strike price. Yes, sir. So that means it gives him the right to sell the underlying asset at seventy. Yeah, one minute. Be quiet. Be quiet when we are explaining something. Okay. Yes, it gives him the right to sell at seventy, the strike price. What? Sir, it gives him the right to. Uh... It's a put. I sold a put. I am the seller. I am now talking about the buyer. I am imagining the buyer's uh, incentives. Okay, everything is incentives. Okay, so I sold a seventy put. That means I have given the buyer the right to sell the underlying asset at seventy. At expiration, the market price is ninety. You are saying the buyer will exercise the put option and sell the underlying asset at seventy. No, sir. Uh, he buy the underlying asset at seventy. You cannot buy the underlying <laughs> asset. Uh, See, the put option does not give you the right to buy. If you want to buy the underlying asset, you have to buy it in the market. Okay. And what is the market price? Ninety. So he, if you want to buy, you have to buy it at the market price. You can't use it. You can't use a put option to buy the option to buy the underlying asset. Yes. So you will buy it at ninety. Well, you just said it. One minute. One minute. One minute. What happens? Shristi is getting bored. You want to help him with the answer? You want to help him with the answer? Let him figure it out. One sec. Are you following what you are saying? I am only repeating what you are saying. I am only holding you to your statements. You said that the buyer will exercise the put option. So I am hold. Now you can't change from there. You are locked into that statement. Okay. The buyer will exercise the put option means the buyer will sell the underlying asset at seventy. Now you want to buy the underlying. If you want to buy, you can't buy by using no, sir, a put option. I will not buy that. You will not buy. You will only sell the underlying asset at seventy. Yes, But then you have a position. You are short at seventy. What is your mark to market P and L? If you are short, one minute. One minute. Don't answer. I want him to answer. You have sold the underlying asset at seventy. What's your underlying? What's your uh, mark to market P and L right now? Sir, you lost on twenty-seven. The loss of twenty-seven. Okay, good. So why did you exercise? If you had not exercised, what would have been your loss? Seven, only seven. Only seven. So why did you exercise? You want to make, you want to lose money. <laughs> I want to do all my, I want to do all my trading with Hardik. Yes, as the counterparty. He works in RBI. He works in RBI. Okay. Okay. So now have you understood that you should not exercise? Is everyone clear? Yes. Sixty. You have followed. Okay, you should not exercise. So the basic logic is you look at the, but don't mechanically just look at the payoff. I think you should for your stages at your stage when you are new to the subject. Okay, uh, I think you should go stepwise like this. That put option. I am a seller. I am the writer. I am a seller. This is the pro profile for the option writer. Okay, short put. This is a short put profit profile. Okay. So therefore, when you want to plot the values to construct this chart, you have to assume that the what is the buyer going to do? Because I am a seller. What is the buyer going to do? Is he going to exercise or not? So you have to look at. So the what has he bought? He has bought a put option that gives them the right to sell. Okay. Then you see that the market price is ninety and the strike is seventy. So why will someone sell at seventy by use exercising the put option when he can sell in the market at ninety? Okay, so therefore he will not exercise. Okay, and in fact you can just look at it that if he sells, if he sells by exercising the put option, he'll have a mark to market loss of twenty dollars. Okay, so immediately has a negative payoff. And you look at this is the best way to do it is the way she has suggested. Two scenarios: if you don't exercise, what's your PNL? And if you exercise, what's your PNL? Is this clear? Right? Sir, if you don't exercise, you will have a PNL of possibly thirty. No, 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 no. One minute. Now we are not talking about the seller's PNL. We are here. We are talking. We are talking about the short put PNL. Okay. So that's why what you see when when the option price is seven, when the option price is ninety, what does it show here? The PNL, the profit. 
Minus seven. Who said minus seven? Who said minus seven? Somebody said minus seven. Suchi said minus seven. Okay. So minus minus for Suchi. Okay. So um, yes. Now you're saying the PNL prop plot is not correct. Against again doing baby steps. Okay. Uh, against when the underlying asset price is uh, is ninety. What is my PNL plot? Because I have plot, uh, plotting profit for given values of the underlying asset price. When the underlying asset price is 90, this chart is showing me a profit plot of plus 7. Okay, you are saying it should be 13. Why? Plus 13, minus 13, what? <coughs> plus 13. Why should it be 13? Uh, sir, there is premium of 5. Premium is 7. Premium of 7 and uh, you are saying that market price of the option right now. Uh, no, I didn't say market price of the option. Terminal stock price. See, these are op put options on stock. Okay, so the underlying asset here is the stock. Okay, so now you are clear. Okay, so that you can see now, therefore, you have to, these are all little tricky because these are new concepts for you. You might have done it in FM1, but you must have forgotten. Okay, but so it's new again for you. These are all very basic things, but you have to get your at least your basics clear. Okay, don't try to build an Empire State building before you can build one, at least construct a stool or something like that first. Okay, make sure your fundamentals are clear and you revise it multiple times until you can just do it like that. Okay, make sure you're thinking the logic is very clear. Okay, so here, because here you're talking about a short put profile, if the option doesn't get exercised, you will be basically pocketing the premium. This is what is happening with let's say maybe almost 80 percent or 90 percent of the policies that insurance companies are selling if you sell a whole bunch of life insurance policies and people start living forever basically <laughs> you just pocket everything right <laughs> we all become immortal then we just pocket they just pocket the premium all right so uh, is this clear now okay so uh, when you sell the option and uh, and you just pocket the premium if it doesn't get exercised okay now we are looking at payoffs what happened? Already Garvid is getting restless. You have a question? You have a question? Yes, yes, yes. I wanted to ask that uh, while we are, we are trading in the software, so we can't exercise. So uh, basically, sir, how will we be able to earn basically? Well, you can sell the option. We can sell the option, but we can't exercise, right? Yeah, so I have put a ban on exercising the option. In any case, most of the time exercising does not make sense because remember, remember we did intrinsic value versus time and time value. Total option value is equal to intrinsic value plus time value. Remember that it's there in your notes somewhere. Okay, if you go further up, you'll see. Okay, what is this? All right, but you remember that one minute, be clear about that. You remember option prime premium is equal to go back and look at the charts in your notes itself. I put that chart from the um, from one of the websites. Okay. Uh, I think options education or something like that. It's a, it's an official website of the OCC options clearing corporation. All right. So option premium is equal to intrinsic value plus time value, right? We don't have time to, we are talking about time value. We don't have time, but uh, if we, if we remember, if you look at your um, option premium, okay. And you look at the strikes, remember what, in, what is intrinsic value? No, you forgot what intrinsic value is. No, parole. What is intrinsic value? Mike. What happened? Do you remember what intrinsic value is? No, you don't. No, you are just reading from the notes. This is not acceptable. It should be clear in your head. Why do you have to refer to the notes? This is very simple stuff. By this time, it should be in your head. One minute, be quiet. Not intrinsic price, intrinsic value. Is underlying price minus? 
No, no. Don't all that. That statement may not be true for all kinds of options. You have to give it in a general English language uh, kind of uh, statement. Intrinsic value is basically think of it conceptually. Intrinsic value is the profit, if any. Loss is not counted. We don't say intrinsic value is negative. Okay. So if it's a profit, or in another way to remember it is what is certain, uh, what they've written in that website that intrinsic value exists only for in the money options. Okay. So intrinsic value is basically the better way to think about it is if you can make any positive profit zero or negative is not zero is fine but negative intrinsic value we don't mention okay so if you can make any profit depending on whether it's a call or a put and where is the exercise price and where is the underlying price can you if you could immediately exercise the option would you make a profit or not okay just imagine what the strike price is whether it's a call or a put and where is the underlying price if you want to exercise the option, would you make a positive profit? If you have a positive profit, then that's the intrinsic value. And the total option value is equal to intrinsic value plus time value. Okay. So the reason that well, Galvit is complaining that there are certain cases where you can read about it in the textbook also. There are certain cases like non-dividend paying put options or non-dividend paying uh, American style put options or non-dividend paying stock. Certain cases, rare cases where you make sense to exercise with very high interest rates and things like that. So, but in general, if you exercise the option, remember this rule that if you exercise the option, all you are capturing is the intrinsic value. Is that correct? Yes. Because what am I doing? If I'm selling a hundred call when the market is ninety, uh, if I if I'm exercising a hundred put when the market is ninety, I'm just capturing that hundred minus the ninety. Okay. But that option will also have some suppose that's a three month option that will have some time value also. So that means if I capture only the ten dollars, the option premium will typically be worth more than ten. It will be worth say maybe twelve or thirteen or something. Yes, so it is better for me to sell off the option because that option price includes both the time value and the intrinsic value. Don't look outside. Okay. Is this clear? Yes. Sir. Are you following? Yes, Remember this logic. Yes, Why does it not generally make sense to, uh, to exercise the option because by exercising you capture only the intrinsic value. But the option price which is trading in the market, open your option trader here and see it. It would contain both time value and exercise value, uh, intrinsic value. Yes, sir. So why not just sell it in the market and get the extra time value benefit also? Yes, yes? is this clear? Yes. Go back and revise this. How to think about intrinsic value? Don't read from the book. You have to. It has to be internally already in your head. You should be able to just go and stand there and mention, uh, talk about it. Clear? Any technical questions? Yes. Any technical questions? No technical questions. <laughs> oh, now it's all going for Diwali. Diwali, Diwali. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.